New Zealanders are adept at digging holes. They've gouged through mountains, carved out cuttings, and dug out dams in an enormously hilly country. On the way, have racked up some pretty well beating records in doing just that. And this is the story of a hole. Maybe you think that's not a very exciting topic for a tale, but this one has an almost fairy tale ring, besides being unique in the history of world geothermal exploration. For you see, it started out to be a 50 centimeter or a 20 inch one. And then one day, it began to grow. And to grow. And to grow. It took just a couple of days to reach the size it is now. About 70 meters in diameter and 22 meters deep. It's unique in that as a whole it became an international tourist attraction. People came from far and wide just to look at its awesome enormity. The country's tourist industry ran buses to here for more than five years, just so that people could look. And then the bottom fell out of it. Not the whole, the viewing business. For 13 years it was active. When it initially erupted, a frightening column of steam could at times be seen more than 120 kilometers away. that steam had the potential to generate enough electricity to keep 50,000 one-bar heaters going continuously. It was a struggling mass of underground energy which had broken the earthen lock which normally chained it. And man had given it the key. It began like any other drilling operation in the thermal regions of New Zealand. The drilling crews from the country's Ministry of Works and Development moved onto the site in late February of 1960. Their job was to investigate the steam potential as a possible power source for electricity generation. With this rig, they were to try to define the western boundary of the region's geothermal field in an area lying about a kilometre and a half southwest of the main production area. The Wairaki field, which supplies steam to turbines here in the central North Island of New Zealand, is responsible for 5.5% of the total electricity generated in the country. Slight though the capacity may seem overall, it is indicative of the vast and diverse energy potential that New Zealand holds. Even with today's technology, it's roughly estimated that the known geothermal resources could generate more than 60% of the nation's total electrical power needs at the present time. There's a 50 kilometer wide belt running for almost 250 kilometers across the North Island of New Zealand. Everywhere it doesn't look quite as dramatic as this, but the signs of heat close to the surface are certainly apparent. And it was in this region that the world's second geothermal power station began to churn out power in the late 1950s. Italy had pioneered the concept some 30 years earlier. And so far, from these surface conditions, 30 geothermal fields have been identified. As technology continues to advance, the possibilities widen. One day, it's believed it may be possible to win geothermal heat from many places where none today appears to exist. It was into this pressure cooker world that the big drilling rig sputtered in. The well was numbered 204. If it wasn't for events that followed, it would still today remain detailed uninspiringly in digits in the files of the Ministry of Works and Development. But well number 204 is now recorded in the annals as the rogue bore. When drilling began on the site, all indications were that the ground was solid. No heat was evident on the surface. But the geology of the volcanic areas changed markedly over short distances. The drilling program did call for the well to pass through a fault but outward appearances failed to reveal what the drill bit was destined to uncover. Difficulties were struck due to loose sand formations while running two strings of casing or protective sheathing for the hole down the well. 
While cementing the inner one down to 122 meters, the cement used was six times the volume of the hole into which it was going, indicating that it was leaking into the surrounding country. Past the 122 meter mark, they didn't set any more casing. Another string was programmed to be set at 300 meters, but the formation there was cold, which signified that there was little likelihood of the well coming under pressure from hot water. Things came to a head on the 2nd of May, 1960. At 350 meters, the drilling mud, which is used to cool the drill bit, began to disappear. It continued to do so for another 20 meters. Then it happened. The drill bit suddenly dropped almost two meters. A cavity had been struck. For three hours, in an attempt to stop the losses, they tried to block up this hole by pumping 20,000 liters of thick drilling mud. But even though it was forced in at a rate of almost 550 liters a minute, the gooey mixture failed to do the trick. Out was brought the drill bit to allow all sorts of material to be put in to try to bridge the leak. They put in chopped up hemp rope, cement, bentonite. But blockages caused a build-up in pressure in the delivery hose, and it burst. The delay taken to replace it allowed the well to come under steam pressure, and it was closed. Water was poured in in an attempt to cool down the steam. The underground build-up of pressure was traveling up the drill hole. If cement hadn't been pumped to strengthen the ground around the rig before drilling began, the steam would have gouged away straight up. But it was deflected by the cement to the side to reach the surface, where it began to carve a path toward the rig. It signaled a desperate need to plug the hole. Some 90 tons of cement slurry were pumped down before all that was on the site was expended. A continuous stream of trucks poured into the area, bringing still more cement to try to contain the emergency. A total of 400 tons was mixed that day, the maximum it was possible to bring to the site. And as the blowout moved further toward the main operation, the decision came to pull out the rig. It had reached a matter of meters away, and there were fears the drilling equipment would disappear into the hole. A driver volunteered to take a transporter to the rig. A rope was passed around his body to drag him clear in the event of disaster. The rig, which in today's term is worth more than a million dollars, was saved. In fact, the loss of equipment was negligible. It amounted to a mere 300 meters of drill pipe. The crater here today reached the size it is now in just a matter of days. Only after the event was it possible to recognize the tremendous forces which came into play when the blowout happened. For more than a kilometer around the site, the trembling earth was an indicator of the enormous underground pressures. For years, the vibrations continued at varying intensities. A 13 square meter tarpaulin laid on the ground downwind of the discharge within days of the breakthrough collected just under 40 kilograms of mud and rock in little more than a minute and a half. For years, the columns of boiling mud and water leapt intermittently up to heights of 15 meters. So great an attraction did the ball become that when it finally subsided, a caller is said to have demanded of the Ministry of Works and Development what right they had to turn the thing off. The lessons from Rogue Bore 204 are numerous and followed a sequence of events which, if any one had not taken place, the blowout would not have occurred. The burst delivery hose which had to be renewed. The time taken to do that allowed the well to heat up and come under pressure. Another factor was not enough water was pumped to cool the well to quench the steam in the two meter cavity just in the same way as it's possible to take a kettle off the boil by adding enough cold water. Today, improvements on similar jobs have been made as a direct result of the lessons learnt on bore 204. Casing is set and cemented at programmed depths, be the walls of the bore hot or cold. If that third string had been put down as scheduled, it's possible the well would have been saved. 
drilling went on in cold conditions. When the bit dropped that critical two metres, the inference was it was into a hot zone. Since no casing was there to contain the pressure, the steam found its own escape route. Up the well and out below the bottom of the second casing string and probably along a fall to the surface. Nowadays, with this firmly in mind, procedure for drilling geothermal wells in new or unknown areas of New Zealand call for the added safety measure of a fourth protective sheathing when drilling even deeper into hot formations. The bore finally died in November of 1973, 13 years after its tumultuous birth. It left its 22 metre deep and 70 metre in diameter scar as witness to the disastrous sequence of events which triggered it. Some 60 countries are within economic reach of utilising geothermal activity. As fossil fuels continue to become more and more expensive, many will be reaching down to tap the deep heat in the earth. Rogue bores have happened before. Those in the business believe there have been more than many have dared to tell. But individual organisations can be loath to talk about their near disasters. So few of the experiences have been explicitly and publicly detailed as those which happened on this job here in New Zealand undertaken by the Ministry of Works and Development. The extensive blow-by-blow -blow documentation of the birth and the death of Rogue Bore 204 has now been written into the annals of international geothermal exploration literature. It remains today as a powerful teaching experience to those daring to harness the awesome forces of nature. It's the lesson of the one which got away.